This is a printed TPU part. And this is Lucas. And this is a TPU tug of war. TPU is not really the strongest material to endure tensile force. There are tons of other filaments that are way better than this, so it's no surprise that Lucas and I can tear this thing apart. So which filament would be best to endure this kind of force? Well, just regular old PLA would be best. PLA has incredibly high tensile strength, and yes, it has other disadvantages, but in terms of tensile strength, it's actually one of the best. As an example, Tom Stanton recently put up a video where he designed a hook that could withstand over a ton of weight. One obvious design feature here is the teeth that sort of grab onto each other. But what I really loved was the internal filleting to allow the layer lines to curve and distribute force without any major concentrations that would lead to weak points. This is a really beautiful design and it's just a hook. I can't believe I'm actually that excited about something that's just a hook. If 10 year old me would realize that I'd be that excited about a hook, they would be worrying about their future. So it's a beautiful design focusing on maximizing tensile strength in a PLA uh -huh. part, but it has internal uh -huh. filling, so it's actually hollow. Uh -huh. It weighs 50 grams, but it can take up to a ton of force. But what is it? A hook. The fuck? But I can't help it. It's, it's a beautiful design and it maximizes PLA's advantages for tensile strength so well. So after watching Tim Station's video, I couldn't help think about how designs like this could be implemented into 3D printed parts to not only capitalize on strength, but also to reduce deficiencies. So back to the TPU part in our tug of war. Yes, it's not the best choice for tensile applications, but it's a good demonstration for what force distribution can do and how you can make the most of your material. Now, I know what you're thinking. Coffee, how can you increase the max strength of a part made of flexible filament? And how is your hair so long and luscious? Well, I'll tell you. Here we have our tug of war specimen, and this is where it snaps. Now we have the same specimen, but instead of just putting it on, I'm going to twist it. I'm going to keep going until there's quite a bit of tension on it. And now I'll close the loop so it stays that way, and now we can do the test again. Let's see what happens. So why does that happen? Well, it's essentially the same as what Tam Stubson did. So the forces exerted are no longer basically direct. Instead, they're sort of corkscrewed around, and it's compressing the flexible filament. And flexible filament is pretty okay with being compressed. Of course, there isn't really a huge amount of applications for this particular thing. This is just a demonstration, um, unless you want the world's most impact-resistant carabiner. So let's apply the concept of force distribution to a printed part, and it should be suitable for basically any 3D printed part. Okay, so this is my basic part. Looks very Christian. I don't know, I, that wasn't intentional. But if we look through the sole of this thing, perimeters and infill, which is pretty standard. But what if we just nail a hole in it as a modifier? That's obviously gonna be atoning for its sins soon. Well, have some faith. Let's test that out. I tested a lot of these and we got very little variation in their breaking point between hollow and normal, like very little. Same goes for deflection. At the same force exerted, you get the same amount of bend despite the hollowness. But why? It's hollow. It should just snap. The other test part even has 20% infill. This one's got nothing. In one way, it really shows how very ineffective infill is when it comes to a bending test. If you want to have a rigid part, you've got to focus on perimeters. The normal test piece has 10 perimeters in total over its entire Z height. The hollow one starts with six, but when the hollow section starts, another eight are added. A little further up, it's pretty much all perimeters, but in the center, it has eight in total. Having this internal geometry allows us to rearrange where the strong parts are, or rather to put the weaker parts somewhere where they are not under much stress. If we look at the remains of our test parts, we can see the normal part with perimeters and infill broke relatively compactly along a single plane as viewed from above but on the sides it absolutely sliced through all the way along but on the hollow one it sort of sheared off diagonally without that much damage spread when you bend something there is a mix of forces you're tensioning one side and on the other you're compressing it tensioning our normal piece with its right angle between perimeters and top and bottom layers is going to concentrate forces in the corner 
but it also concentrates force in that relatively narrow perimeter structure, pulling the sides apart and causing a rip along the layer line. On our edited internal geometry model, we don't see much of a layer line rip, even though that is the weakest structural part, because of the heavy reinforced corners. Slicers optimize wall generation so they align with the outer wall, but also with any internal geometry. So if your part is curved, yeah, you'll have a curved path. And also with arachne wall generation, gaps are less of a problem when doing this. And while it would be cool to have a slicer curve perimeters for anywhere where there is a right angle between walls or walls on top and bottom infill, this isn't just about having a curved internal geometry. This is about putting the perimeters in the right place. Using a method like this can give you an advantage when it comes to strength to weight ratio. If you need high flexural strength, but also a lightweight part, this could be very useful. And with a little optimization, we managed to get about a 10% weight reduction while maintaining a very similar breaking strength. However, simply dumping a negative modifier in a part is neither efficient nor effective, unless you literally have just a straight part. And while we do have an extremely advanced testing apparatus at our disposal, we don't have the best to work with on this any further. So I guess we'll have to get one. Changes like these and term sterpins basically revolve around changing the perimeter path from a right angle to a curve. It's obviously not about putting a big hole in the middle of your part. And lots of people know about this, lots of designers and engineers know about this, but most people who use a printer don't know about these. And if we look at most slicers focusing in on the strength section and the walls and the infill, there is not a huge amount of variation in what you can do. I think it's high time features like curved inner perimeters and patterning for inner perimeters are made. There are a bunch of features that have been suggested by community members, such as interlocking layers, brick layers, gradient infill, but all of these, uh, they're not actually available as one click features on slicers. I also think, or at least hope, that techniques like 5-axis printing or non-planar printing will become more mainstream in the near future, although these have been mostly ignored, so more emphasis on the hope part. If you like this video and you also want to destroy mainstream commercialism by printing your own stuff, then join our Discord server where there is talk about 3D printing on a daily basis. We'll be back with another video next week, so until then, later. Coming this Sunday to the Poughkeepsie Civic Center, Force Distribution, and the Fifth Axis, supported by Non-Planer.